Okay, to recap from part one of this two-part series, we made a poplar exterior bowl and hollowed that out and turned it very thin. And then we reversed that. We recorded the shape, reversed it on a jam chuck, and turned off the bottom. So we have a hollow shape. Then we turned a honey locust interior bowl that that previous bowl will attach to. And we discovered a little bit of a problem. The bottom angle of the poplar bowl was at about a 45 degree angle and really that needs to be straight so it can slide on properly onto the interior bowl of the honey locust. So that's where we're at right now. I'm cleaning up that bottom edge and making it nice and flush or parallel to the bed lathe. And now we're going to take this off the jam chuck and reattach it or refit it to the honey locust. Now the honey locust bowl blank is mounted to a face plate so we can just quickly put that back onto the headstock and everything will line up and we don't have to worry about it not turning true. It'll turn just fine. Now when we slide this over with the new edge you can immediately see all of the progressive mistakes I made. I kept trying to reshape that honey locust so it, it would fit the bottom of the bowl but because of the angle of the poplar exterior bowl, there was no way it was going to line up. It couldn't fit over that because of the angle. So now we have a nice straight angle. So it should line up very well with that. So I'm going to continue shaping the honey locust so that it will accept that poplar piece properly. The problem with doing this and all the mistakes I made is I ate up a bunch of the stock of the honey locust. So the bull blank has progressively become smaller and smaller. And I'll tell you what, it's a lot of eyeballing and you really need to take your time and check out what's fitting, what's not fitting, where it's contacting, and what can be removed so that it fits properly. So you really want to take your time and check it out and line it up and make sure that everything's turning well. I'm just using the carbide scraper here to remove a little bit of material and I'm just going to whittle away a bit at a time until we get a proper fit. Okay, so the base is starting to fit properly. The right side of this is starting to fit properly. Now I need to establish the rim area. Unfortunately, I've removed so much material from the, the under underside bowl, the, the smaller bowl of the honey locust, that that top rim, there's barely any material there. I originally hoped to have the honey locust make like a, a rim that wrapped around the top of the poplar bowl on the outside, but that's not going to be possible now. I typically don't turn with carbide scrapers just because they're so rough as far as the finish and the technique of scraping isn't um, doesn't give us a bevel riding cut so it's a little bit more difficult but for right now just roughing out and quickly removing material is that tool seems to work really well so I'm just I'm not really concerned with a very smooth surface at the moment I just want to get the shape of the bowl and the material turned away so we keep fitting that exterior piece over and checking where it's contacting and smoothing up those areas I've got a little bit of a high spot here. I'm afraid that that inside of the poplar is rubbing that, so I'm going to scrape that away. And it's going to be reduced overall anyway because I want there to be a, a thickness difference between the exterior bowl and the interior. I want to give a sense of depth with that space between the two bowls. So I'm just going to quickly hog out some material. So now you can see that straight in angle that I need for the base of the bowl. So I'm going to make that cut with the carbide scraper and now it's fitting much better than it was before. So obviously now after the fact it makes sense that if you're going to have a bowl slide over another bowl you really want that connecting point to be really close to straight.
The nice part of the carbide scraper here is it gives you a really, really crisp edge on the corner here. And that's what we're trying to establish is to create a corner edge that's really crisp. So that's very helpful, especially in those corners. Okay, so we've established the bottom and I'm basically turning away what I, what I cleared out there with the carbide scraper is a little hollow area that's going to allow that to I'm marking this as my outside edge now that it's hard to see here but that rim is lined up with that surface that I'm marking so I need to clear away those extra rings on the bottom to bring up the bottom of the bowl and to do that I'm going to get my half inch bowl gouge but first I'm going to go ahead and scrape and determine that top edge where the the bowl meets the top edge of the piece and I'm going to hog out a little more material. This whole process again is very experimental and it's just kind of a process of trial and error. So it's a little time consuming. You need to be patient doing this when you're doing it and you don't want to race the process. So now that we've established at the bottom area and where they, the bottom of the bowl will be, I can remove this excess material and shape the bottom of the bowl. And I'm doing that with my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. I'm just making very simple push cuts from the shoulder up to that rim. I want to be careful not to go past that rim because that's where the other exterior poplar bowl will be. This is like a big puzzle. <laughs> it's it's actually fun. It's a it's a fun exercise to do because it really makes you think and problem solve and think through the process. So here I can see I still have extra material. The pencil line is my target. I want to bring the edge right down to that pencil pencil line, but I don't want to remove any more than that pencil line. I'm just doing a sweeping push cut, riding the bevel right up to that line. And we'll take a look at that. I'm gonna use a light scraping cut to bring, bring the edge right up to that pencil line. And by doing that, I'm kind of distorting that inside convex curve, so I need to clean that up a bit. And we'll check it again. Okay, that's looking really good. So now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to transfer that curve of the bowl to another piece of material. And I'm gonna sketch out roughly where that indentation will be. So this inner curve is about a quarter of an inch or maybe, um, what would that be? <laughs> Help me out, guys, here. I think it's about probably six millimeters, maybe eight millimeters. And then that's going to go, and this is going to indicate to us where I need to be cutting away the interior. Because, again, I want that exterior bowl to be away from the interior ex the interior surface of the inner bowl, if that makes any sense. So this should be the shape that I'm turning on the interior bowl. This cutaway will be that, that relief area. And here you can see what I'm talking about. I basically need to turn out that inside portion and clean it out. I'll crisp up those edges again with the square carbide scraper. And then I'll keep checking that form and see how close we're getting. It's pretty close there.
but we need to go in quite a bit so I'm going to go ahead and take off a little bit deeper cut it's a nice thing about using the contour profile from the beginning when we shaped the profile of that exterior poplar piece all right so that's the exterior of the honey locust bowl now I'm going to reverse this mount it to the four jaw chuck and I'm going to turn out the interior of the honey locust bowl first I need to take off the faceplate so we're done with the faceplate at this point we want to make sure that those jaws are seated right on top or the shoulder rather is seated right on top of the jaws and I'm going to clean up the face of this to start off now like I said earlier what I was hoping for is that this bowl would have a, a top rim that would wrap around that exterior thin turning but because of the little error of lining up the bottom of that poplar piece I had to turn away a bunch of this honey locust so essentially the exterior bowl is going to be the top rim is going to be really close to the top rim of this bowl it's not what I had planned but it should work out fine so leaving the core of the bowl intact I'm now shaping the rim very delicately. I want to have a, a gentle curving rim that curves down into the bowl. And I'm watching the exterior shape of this, make sure I have enough material to make this shape. Because I got to remember I have that indented portion on the exterior of this bowl. And I'm speeding this process, process up a bit if you guys have seen me turn away the interior of many bowls, I do not turn from the center out. I turn from the rim in. So what I do is that that leaves a mass in the center. And that mass that's in the center of this provides stability for that outer wall. So I can do really delicate moves like this scraping cut and curve that the rim of that bowl and not have to be so concerned with the, there being a lot of vibration in the bowl. The center mass that's still in there helps stabilize this whole turning and keeps it really, really uh, balanced. So I essentially just work my way down the walls, removing material as I go. And as that material is removed, I'm exposing the shape of the interior of the bowl. This is a nice clean bowl. This is approximately five inches across or about 12 centimeters. You want to make light cuts here and I'm, what I'm doing is I'm merging each cut with the previous so that I have a nice continuous surface on the interior of the bowl. Alright, that's feeling really good. I'm going to make one last pass to merge all of those surfaces together. It's almost not visible but if you touch it you can feel the different surfaces from the different cuts and a gentle light pass very very light cut merges all of those together you want to be very slow in the center cut there you don't want to rip out fibers okay so now I'm going to go through the grits I sand from 120 or 180 is where I start and then I go to 240 and 320 And I'm not sanding through the center. I do that by hand because I don't want to sand the center down. Like here's what I'm doing. With the lathe off, I turn that by hand back and forth, and that cleans up the center portion. If I were to do that with the lathe on, it would basically be sanding the center twice, and it would reshape the bottom of the bowl, and we really don't want that. Okay, so with this bowl complete, I'm going to apply some tried and true Danish oil 
This is pure linseed oil. It has no dryers, metals, or any other agents in it. It's essentially linseed oil and nothing else. That's why I love this product. I also love their tried and true original, which is the, this linseed oil combined with beeswax. The tried and true brand is fantastic. Uh, they don't pay me, uh, but I I just love their product because it's, it's a, just an all natural product and it does a great job creating a finish. Now I'm being really careful here not to apply any finish to the edges where the exterior bowl will attach because I'm going to need to glue those edges. So for right now, I'm just going to apply finish to the areas that are exposed and will be visible, but not to the contact areas. And the linseed oil can be applied in multiple layers. You can apply multiple coats. And depending on the wood species, some wood species will soak this up right away. And others, you can put one coat on and it looks great. Okay, so now I'm going to use a jam chuck to remove the foot of this bowl. The way to do that is you mount the jam chuck to the lathe. And I actually have a video all about jam chucks if you want to check it out. There's a lot of information there. But you bring the tailstock up, recenter the bowl blank, and now you have access to the tenon and the foot. So we can remove the tenon and shape the foot of the bowl. So I'm using my half inch 55 degree bevel swept back bowl gouge. And I'm gonna make push cuts in towards the headstock. This helps stabilize the turning. We have pressure that goes up onto that jam chuck and into the headstock. So it's, it's a very stress-free cut to make for an end grain or an end to end mount like this. So what I do is I basically reduce that tenon down to a nub in the center and then I'll start shaping the foot of the bowl. I want the inside of the foot to be concave so that it doesn't wobble when it's seated on the table. You really want to take your time and get the tool rest right where you want it for really good support. Okay, so I'm going to make a flat face cut, just a push cut across there to clean up the foot of the bowl. Make sure that's nice and squared. And then I'm going to push in a little bit. You can see there is becoming a just slightly concave. Now I'll go continue that concave curve because I want that foot of the bowl on the exterior of the foot to contact the table and not the any other part of the foot. Now I'll switch over to my 3 8 inch detail spindle gouge and this will help me reduce that nub even farther. Just light push cuts is all you need here. And then I'm going to continue that concave curve on the inside of the foot. Just delicate light cuts and keep reducing the size of that nub. If you're not comfortable at this point, you can stop and you can cut that off with a knife or a small saw and then you can sand it. What I like to do is here is I'll apply inward pressure pretty firmly and then I'll turn the lathe off and that will slice through those fibers and cut that nub right off. There's a little bit of a rough surface there, but that sands very easily. Okay, so just using the edge of the sander, I can just gently brush across the center portion. I want to be really careful not to touch the rim of the foot because that sanding disc will obviously reshape the foot as well. But just gently brush across that and I'll flip it over and sand both sides so it's nice and even. And the center of that will be completely removed. Okay, so then I use my wood burning setup and I use a chisel bit to sign my name. 
I found that this seems to be the most permanent and clear way to sign a bowl. No matter what finish you put on it, it's that image is going to be burnt in there for pretty much forever. Each wood is a little bit different as far as temperature too. The wetter woods and the harder woods need a little bit higher temperature. The softer woods and drier woods, the temperature needs to be turned down a little bit. And the, the wood burning tool has a adjustable setting so you can adjust that heat based on the particular wood that you're doing or what project you want to do or what the look is you want to get with the piece. All right, so with the Honey locust portion done. I'm going to return now to the poplar portion and I'm going to start drawing the graphic of what I'm going to carve on this piece. And I'm using a basic circle template here. What I'm tracing is our circles that are going to be throughout the this pattern and I'm going to connect them with organic lines. But I'm going to make a, ser a series of random circles across this piece using the circle template first. You want to just take your time. Now, of course, you can do any design you want. I was originally thinking about doing something with like a sun sunrise and a silhouette of a tree, but I decided to go with something a little more abstract with these circles. You can see I'm changing up the sizes of them. Some are large, some are smaller. But I'm creating two circles, and that's going to be the thickness of the area that will remain. We're going to be cutting away a bunch of negative spaces here. Okay, so with the circles drawn, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of sketching out some organic lines, almost like roots, that are connecting these circles to one another and also to the rim of this piece. The top and bottom rim I'm not going to cut away. I need that material to match up with the, the other piece. Here I'm actually just rotating the bowl on the jam chuck. This jam chuck is mounted in my vise. And so the jam chuck not only has been designed to hold the bowl cleanly on the lathe, but it actually holds it really well here when I'm working on the drawing. Now I'm using a small tool. This tool is called a is, is called Presto, and it's by Nakanishi Incorporated. And what it is is essentially a pneumatic tool that's it's powered by air and it's rotating at insane rpms it's i believe it's somewhere in the neighborhood of 30,000 rpms so it's super super high rpm and it creates a very 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 fine carving and i'm using a, a grinding tip that's designed to work with cross cut grain now the trick with this is the grain of this wood is kind of all over the place, and I don't know that the poplar is the best to be carving, but this is something, I haven't done much of this, to be quite honest, so I'm not claiming to really know what I'm doing with this, I'm just experimenting. But what I've discovered is I need to work through in layers, and I need to, I can't just make a solid cut all at once, I need to go through a little bit at a time, and also poking through different points, and then working between those, those sections to connect the dots. But this seems to work pretty good, although occasionally the tool will want to grab the grain and run with the grain. So you've got to really work to counter that. And there's other times based on when it's cutting, if it's going against the grain or sideways to the grain, it cuts beautifully. But if it gets caught in between a couple grain lines, it can drift off of where you intended to, to carve with it. So you, it's just like anything else. It takes some practice, and the, the more you do it, the, the better you get. But what I discovered also here was the bottom of this bowl is much thicker, probably twice as thick as the top rim was. So in hindsight, as thin as I thought I turned this initially, I really should have turned it thinner, and I should have used my calibers to measure all the way down the bowl to make sure that it was very even. 
my index finger and my thumb were pretty good indicators that it was close, but it was not really easy to tell if it was exactly on point. Now this is a RAM power micromotor. It's kind of like a Dremel. And I'm using a disc sander to clean up any rough edges created by the Presto pneumatic tool. All right, so we've got the piece carved. Now I sped that up really fast because it honestly took several hours and it was quite time consuming and I didn't want to bore you guys to death. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to color this. I'm going to color it using India ink. I've been called out several times by several people for saying Indian ink. <laughs> I guess that's like saying America ink versus American ink. Uh, I'm not really seeing that big of a difference, but we'll call it India ink because that's what it's officially called. But this is Speedball India ink, and I use this as one of the ebonizing techniques. And I actually have a video about ebonizing if you want to check that out. But what's nice about this is it's shellac based. So the binding agent for India Speedball India ink is shellac. What makes that nice is this is UV resistant meaning the sun won't fade it, and it's archival, which means it's designed to last for a very long time. So it's not going to fade, it's not going to get dingy looking or gray over time. It's going to stay a nice crisp black. And that shellac that's the binding agent in it is essentially the finish that we use already. So we know that we're going to get a good wood finish with, a, with shellac. Not all India inks have shellac in them, and not all of them are UV resistant and that's why this is so important. So you want to take your time with this piece. I'm taking my time to go around it. There were several little edges that I missed initially. Plus the first coat is kind of dull. So you want to put two coats on it. So take your time and and make sure it gets well coated and then of course let this dry thoroughly. But all in all the the ink dries pretty quickly. So now it's time to put the two together and see what we got. Uh, there it is, all that effort, and we've got a bowl that has an exterior and an interior made of two different woods and two different looks. i got to say I'm pretty happy with it. I, it's not exactly what I thought it was going to turn out to be, but there was a lot of stuff learned from this, and all in all, I think it turned out to be a really, really nice piece. I hope you guys enjoyed this. All right, so there it is, two bowl blanks to create one bowl. There was a lot of work in here, but it was pretty fun to put this together. I have to say there were a lot of lessons learned and I kind of looked at this whole project as a, an experiment to kind of navigate some of the thin carving or thin turning and piercing capabilities. And I think I'm gonna probably do some more of this in the future, but I was looking at this as more of an, an experiment and a way to kind of get my feet wet on this and th this was kind of fun. I like it. The, the overall shape is okay. I think it could be a little bit better. I wish some things had turned out a little bit differently. I wish I still had more material for this inside bowl so I had a little bit of a lip here to recover this top edge of the outside carving. But all in all I think it turned out to be a pretty cool piece and it's pretty unique. It's kind of what I had in mind when I was thinking of this initially. It's fun when you've got an idea in your head and you feel like you, you just got to do it. And that's where I was today. And that's where this bowl came from. It's just an idea. And I think there'll be plenty more where this came from. All right, guys, if you've liked this video, do me a huge favor and click that like button below the screen right now. That helps this video and helps the channel out. It helps broadcast it to others as well and helps grow this channel. So if you can click like on this and any other videos you see of mine that you like, it's a big help and I greatly appreciate that. If you're not subscribing, click that subscribe button and click the bell and you'll be notifi notified when my next videos come out. All right, guys, thank you so much for watching. And as always, until next time, happy turning.